children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor Thanks, Shannon and Curly. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. What beautiful words to start our time together today. We're here today to farewell and celebrate the life of a wonderful and much loved person. Teresa Gwendolyn May Munyard. Teresa is survived by Glenn, her husband of 28 years, mother to Brody, Shannon, Kiralee, and Hannah, mother in law to Bella, daughter of Errol and Rhonda, sister to Kevin, Andrea, and Christina, sister in law to Jenny, Sam, and Jason. Daughter-in-law to Morrie, deceased, and Florence. Sister-in-law to Greg and Ray. Neil and Jill. Ross and Wendy. And Jan and Dennis. Much love auntie to many nephews and nieces. A loving family member to numerous cousins. And a caring friend to so many. Teresa was born on the 16th of February 1970 and passed away in the afternoon of the 31st of March 2020. She was 50 years of age. My name's Lee Cunningham and I'd like to extend a warm welcome to you today on behalf of the Munyard and Cooper families. I'm a close friend of both Glenn and Teresa and I was lucky enough to grow up with the Munyard and Cooper families at the Norlunga Centre Church of Christ. Glenn and Teresa's wedding was the first wedding that I recall attending. 
that was within my own circle of friends. Glenn and Teresa have both had a significant impact on my life. They led my wife Amanda and I through our preparation for marriage and have stayed with us on that journey over the years. Glenn conducted our wedding ceremony. Whether they were living at Hackham, Morfitt Vale, Ranella, Port Nalunga, McLaren Flat or Strathalban, Glenn and Teresa's place for me has always been a place where I've regularly laughed until I've cried. But just as importantly, it's also been a safe place where when needed, I've also been able to cry until I'm ready to laugh again. That is true friendship. As with so many of her friends, Teresa regularly spoke words of light and love into my life at times when they were, both, were most needed. And for that, I will be always thankful. Although today it would be easy to feel distant or separated from each other because we are unable to gather collectively in the same place and share in this time together, today we choose to focus on the things that unite all of us, whether in this room, in another room together, or online. We are here because we love Teresa. We are here because Teresa's life has positively and profoundly impacted ours. We are here because we want to show our love and support to her family. And as Teresa would want each one of us to be reminded, the other thing that we have in common is that we are all loved unconditionally and extravagantly by our Heavenly Father. As there's no opportunity today to sign an attendance register, the family would love for you to, at some stage during the live feed, share your name in the comments section so they can be encouraged and know that you were here with them, sharing in this time, remembering Teresa. Will you pray with me? Dear loving Heavenly Father, we gather today to remember the precious life of Teresa. We also gather to say goodbye one last time and celebrate the life that she enjoyed here on earth and thank you for each precious moment and memory that we have had with her. Her life has touched so many in so many different ways. We pray that your peace and presence will be upon each one of us during this time and we pray this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're now going to look to various members of Teresa's family to share their eulogies of Teresa with us. Hello, I'm Teresa's mum, Rhonda. And I'm Teresa's dad, Errol. On the 16th of February 1970, Errol, my mother and I arrived at Queen Victoria Hospital at 7.30am and at 7.50am Teresa Gwendolyn May was born. In those days, husbands were not allowed to be present at the births. I was so happy God had blessed us with a daughter because there were, at that time, lots of Cooper boy babies. At two weeks of age, Teresa slept through most nights for eight hours. She was a happy and contented baby. She walked at ten months so she could run with her brother, who she was always trying to keep up with. There were no kindies at Hackham in those days. So Teresa went straight to school at Hackham East Primary. In 1976 we moved house and Teresa went to Morford Vale South Primary School. She played netball for the school and was an excellent goal shooter. She continued netball for quite a few years in goal attack or goal shooter positions. She was a model student and her reports from grade one to year 11 are full of praise for Teresa's efforts and good character. At the young age of seven, she was introduced to horses by her auntie Betty and cousin Paula and fell in love instantly. Teresa and Paula spent countless hours together discussing their plans for the future with horses. Both have succeeded in their plans 
Our darling Teresa used her passion for horses and her passion for helping people as her Christian ministry and has reached a lot of young people. Growing up, our, ch growing up, our children had a variety of pets. Teresa's favourites were cats, mittens who had 13 kittens at one time and cattles who lived till 17 years old. Teresa looked after them very well. Teresa started work on the 6th of January 1986 for the Department of Lands and her bank account started for her, her horse. When she had enough money saved she bought a Palomino and called her Honey. Honey was adjusted at Hackham. When Teresa was unable to feed Honey at night I would do the job. Andrea and Christina would go with Teresa sometimes and she would make them clean the stable and pick up the manure while she was doing other things for honey. Teresa went to TAFE for two years to learn more on horse care at which she excelled. Teresa growing up belonged to Norlunga Centre Church of Christ, formerly Christie's Beach Church of Christ. Starting off being on the cradle roll from birth, Sunday school age three, then attended Christian Endeavour with Florence Munyard as the leader, Girls Brigade with Cousin Veronica as the leader, Spice, a children's singing group, then progressed to the youth group. She made her decision for Christ and on the 20th of December 1987, along with her future sister-in-law Jenny, was baptised by Maury Munyard. A very happy day for them. In holidays, we and extended family would go on camping trips. Teresa loved fishing, walking on the beach, picking up shells, walking in the scrub and being in the great outdoors, campfires and cooking damper. There were lots of good times. Teresa and I had great conversations and discussions as she was growing up and after her marriage. She led a very busy life and in November the 2018, we had the opportunity to hunt, have lunch, just the two of us. It was just like old times, we both enjoyed it, and I will treasure that and many other great memories forever. Her favourite saying, which settled quite a few disputes amongst people, was build a bridge and get over it. Quite often people would stop and think about it and get over whatever their dispute was about. There are lots of memories, of course, but one in particular stands out for me. About four years ago, I mentioned to Teresa I was going to the Port Vincent unit on my own to do some maintenance work. And right away, she asked if she could come with me to get her Wirraway paperwork done without distractions. Of course, I said yes. We both achieved what we set out to do plus had time for father-daughter bonding. Walking along the beach, having coffee, meals and a glass or two of red, and just talking and laughing. It was great to have this time together, just us two. I will treasure that memory and Teresa told me it meant a lot to her too. Lots of treasured memories forever. Amongst the church youth group, there was a young man named Glenn who asked Teresa out. Easter 1990, we were camping at Berry with extended family and Glenn came to visit Teresa. She was very, very happy. Glenn arrived in his trusty blue Mazda. That car was a legend. It broke down and Maury had come to get Glenn and the car and take them back to Adelaide but not before Teresa and Glenn spent time together, and that was the beginning of a beautiful and amazing relationship. This is a message from Cousin Veronica. When I returned home from a near fatal accident in the US, we had a late Christmas celebration at Lisa's house. I remember Teresa's gift to me of lovely aloe vera infused green socks to soothe my poor feet and make it a bit easier for me to walk. So th thoughtful. Her children didn't know me very well, but she had prepared them 
so they were able to sit and chat with me. I still have those socks and they are special to me. To me, Teresa was a woman of compassion and integrity. Never afraid of getting her hands dirty and always prepared to help. An incredible lady who is now at peace. Love, Veronica. And this is a message from Veronica's sister, Lisa. One day I visited Lisa, Teresa at the McLaren flat, flat home. <laughs> there was a chook which looked a bit odd. Teresa explained that the kids had found it with a hole in its neck after a fox attack. The kids said, fix it up, fix it up, Mum. So Teresa put antiseptic on it, being purple in colour, and sticky plaster, not expecting it to survive. It kept living, and Teresa wondered how she was going to get the plaster off. She decided it had to stay there. The feathers grew around the plaster, and the chook survived for quite a while. We laughed and laughed. Teresa was an amazing, strong, loving child of God. Her faith, wisdom and character live on in her children. Teresa is in her forever home and in the arms of Jesus, her face smiling and all pain gone. Love, Lisa. Our darling Teresa, a woman of sweetness, kindness, thoughtfulness, integrity, empathy and compassion. Love you, darling daughter. Till we meet again. Amen. Amen. Hi, I'm Kevin, uh, Teresa's elder brother, and it's, be, it's on behalf of my sisters, Andrea and Christina, and our partners and extended family. And I'd just like to share with you some thoughts and memories that we have of Teresa. Of course, there are so many memories and fond times that we would just be able to bring a few before you today. And for as long as we can remember, Teresa had a passion for horses, even from a young age, and it only got stronger over time. She would talk about them constantly, and her room was full of horses. Horse bed, horse pillows, horse posters and even a horse height chart on her wardrobe door that is still there today. Teresa had a horse called Honey. We would often go with her to see her horse and was able to spend time with Teresa as she spent time with Honey. Teresa even had Honey at home in the backyard for her 16th birthday while she camped outside in the yard with her friends. We think Dad may have liked the fertiliser in the garden. But Teresa had a huge passion for horses. Uh, many of you watching today have had experience with Teresa, with the horses and the huge ministry that has come out of the passion for horses. And um, it's been really fantastic but Teresa had a, a huge love for all animals, including cats. And one of her favourites that she had was called Cuddles. On the animal theme, Teresa also loved the Muppets, especially Miss Piggy and Kermit the Frog. She even made a paper mache head of Kermit as a school project, which she kept for many years after. As kids, we loved to spend time in the backyard, in the big cubby house, just hanging out, playing board games, not doing too much, maybe playing a bit of backyard cricket. And uh, quite often there was the family game of Saturday afternoon netball. Uh, Teresa was really good at netball. Uh, such a little goal attack, she was ferocious on the court. I've had a bit of a coldy thing this week, thank goodness it's not the virus, but it got me to remembering when Teresa and I would quite often have bronchitis at the same time and spend a lot of time uh, sharing steam in the shower room 
while well, given a horrible medicine called Brondicon uh, by mum to try and uh, stop the cough. I hated the stuff and Teresa said it tasted like bitter cherries. I love to read a book series called Trixie Belden about a girl detective and had the whole the whole series uh, and she would read them at night before going to bed and she also loved the Nord Football Club. She'd go to the football with uh, mum and grandma. She had a crush on a young fella called number 17 David Payne and she even had a toy frog with number 17 on its jumper sitting in the window. For her first car Teresa got a, something that uh, Dad liked, a mechanically sound vehicle, was a thing called a Simpka. Not a great looking car and it didn't take long for Teresa when she got her job to get rid of that and bought her uh, beloved dark green Toyota Celica sports car. Teresa loved spending time in the outdoors. Um, I've taken this here out of my backyard because when I look across my back fence and see what you can see, I remember Teresa. She loved both the ocean and the bush. Her for first snorkeling experience with Andrea at Blue Holes Beach in Cowberry was in Teresa's words, amazing, and she loved it. And we'll remember our first fall driving trip to Robe. We got stuck on the beach with our family and Glenn and Teresa's family for four hours with uh, seven little kids running around and an incoming tide. In recent years, Teresa loved going to the Grampians in Victoria. In particular, she loved hunting for wildflowers, having campfires and camp cooking, especially brother-in-law's Sam's stew and damper. She just loved sitting by fire relaxing and talking and we will also always remember Teresa's dessert pizzas. Teresa was very fierce on the mini golf course which she was very competitive and usually won. Teresa was always easy to talk to. She was so wise and always had insightful things to say that you could always talk to her about anything and know that she would listen to you without judging. Teresa's faith in God was never ending and never wavered. She loved God with such a passion and loved to share his love with others. It was really great to hear of so many who have felt her love, her caring words, her nurturing ways and her beautiful nature made everyone feel like they were her best friend. We will miss our loved, beautiful sister Teresa so much. As we go forward in life, we feel blessed to have had her in our lives. I'm thankful to be left with so many happy memories. We're also thankful to know that our Teresa is in the arms of Jesus, resting peacefully. Teresa, our dear sweet sister, we love you so much and look forward to seeing you again one day. Brody, I'm Teresa's, Teresa's eldest child and only son. Mum was the most loving and caring mother that I could have ever asked for. Mum always went the extra mile in making us feel loved and appreciated. I know that Mum loved us kids immensely. The day after Mum's passing, was my birthday, a day when growing up at first light in the morning, I would jump up into mum and dad's bed, squash in with the whole family, followed by prezzies and readings from mum's fam famous baby book, 
that she'd put together for each one of us kids. Mum had a baby book full of our baby firsts, like our first words, first haircuts, first steps, first time when we sent, said mum's name, etc. She also went above and beyond by creating individual journals of us, full of funny stories, experiences, cute things we would say and do, and other special memories. Books of memories we can now cherish and look back on for the rest of our lives, as we have over the past couple of weeks. I'd like to share an entry that mum wrote when I was almost four years old. This is from the year 2000. <laughs> Tonight, I put you to bed and you came out. <laughs> Sorry. Tonight, I put you to bed and you came out a while later saying you wanted someone with you because you were scared. I told you to go to bed and talk to Jesus and he would help you not feel scared. <laughs> you promptly went back to bed and a few seconds later I hear a little voice. I went next to your room and listened to you and you were praying and asking Jesus to help you not feel scared and to take away the monsters. And you said, thank you for mummy and a lovely day and amen. <laughs> You came out a little while later and wanted a light on, but apart from that, you went off to sleep. I had tears in my eyes as I listened to you praying, and I was very encouraged in just being a mum. I love you, my darling. <laughs> mum was a very hard-working woman who would do whatever it took to get a job done that needed to be done. I remember very clearly there was one night um, that pushed mum to her limit. <laughs> I was 12 at the time and mum and dad had just started their own brick making business called Timber Creek. It was Timber Creek's first big job and the time to complete the job may have been a, a bit underestimated. All through the night mum and dad made the bricks by hand to get the job done. Meanwhile, us kids all slept in the work office. I remember driving home the next morning as the sun was rising, watching mum defrosting her fingers in the front of the car heater. We were all pretty stoked though because we had the next day off of school because mum and dad needed to go home and sleep. <laughs> A few of the other memories with mum that I'll cherish forever include watching Gilmore Girls in bed with her and Hannah family camping trips to the Flinders Ranges and the Grampians, our family holiday to Thailand, beach walks on a recent trip to the Gold Coast, and most recently, Bella and my wedding where mum blessed, where mum blessed our marriage with prayer. And then later in the evening, a special first dance between mum and I. I'm also very thankful for the relationship that Bella had with my, uh, that my mum had with, my, with Bella, my wife. <laughs> mum loved Bella. When Bella and I just started dating, mum told me that I was never allowed to break up with Bella because it would be too painful for her. <laughs> mum and Bella had many special times together, mostly over horse ride outings. In recent days, although it wasn't under the greatest circumstances, visits to mum while she was in hospital were very rich time in our, times in our relationship. Our time together in there was intentional and we wanted every minute to count. I cherish our conversations about life and about God during this time. I always knew that mum loved God and she had a very... Real, <laughs> I 
I always knew that mum loved God and that she had a very real relationship with Jesus. But it was during this time that I really saw how strong and relentless her love for God was. Patients that accompanied mum in hospital would often tell mum that they didn't understand why she was in there because she was always so thoughtful and loving and peaceful. Mum suffered in her mind. Though mum suffered in her mind, she listened to people's stories and often encouraged them in their own journey with mental health. She loved introducing us to the people that she met in there and the other patients seemed to love meeting us too. I'm guessing that's because she would have talked about us a lot. About four weeks ago was the time I got was the last time I got to have some quality time with Mum. She was in hospital at the time. Mum shared honestly with me about being fed up with the thoughts and feelings that plagued her mind constantly. And she talked about looking forward to the day ahead where she could just wake up in peace and talk to God without all the noise. It was an emotional time, but we spent good time praying and playing cards together. I'm so thankful that mum let me in on her journey and enjoyed spending time, this time with me. Mum, life will never be the same without you. I'm going to miss your laughs and big hugs. I'm going to miss our deep conversations and times of prayer. I'm going to miss trips away and family nights with you. I'm going to miss sharing my life's highs and lows with you. Thank you for loving me always. Thank you for raising me up in God's truth. Thank you for showing me how to work hard. Thank you for showing me how to love and accept others for who they are. And thank you for showing me how to hold on to faith throughout the hardest of times. Mum, my heart aches. knowing that this is goodbye for now. But we will meet again in paradise. I miss you immensely, and I love you more than my words can express. Thanks. Hannah, the youngest and funniest child. I firstly want to thank my siblings. I love you so much. And my dad for being the rock in my life and in our lives. You could say I've always been the sookiest mama's girl. Probably because that... I was so cute that mum never wanted to leave me alone. So I managed to get away with everything. As Brody mentioned before, mum wrote pages and pages of memories that she had of us to look back on when we grew older. As I was reading back on these a few days ago, she mentioned that she struggled with me as a child because I would cry because I would cry whenever she would put me down up until I was two years old. Up until I was at least 12, I would always get homesick, going to sleepovers, because I just wanted mum to be with me. I think this was because every night before I went to bed, I'd make mum a Milo 
warm up her wheat bag and jump into bed next to her and watch an episode of McLeod's Daughters. That's my favourite memory of mum. Just her cuddles. I felt so safe whenever I was near her. I honestly thought that I'd never be able to live without her. I'm going to miss her wearing her purple fluffy dressing gown, her odd boots and her warm skin. I'm going to miss long drives together, going camping as a family. Sitting around the warm fire, telling jokes and playing funny family games. I'm going to miss seeing you sitting in the stands, cheering in my football games. I'll even miss her telling me to go to my room and giving me a lecture. She's the exact mother that I want to be, the kind of mother who never rests her head before making sure that all of her children know how much they are loved, the kind of mother who constantly puts her family before herself. A mother that can be a best friend, but knows when to discipline. A mother that works hard for her children and, teach them, and teaches them what hard work is. I was taught many things from mum. One of these was how to care for our pets. Brody, Kirillia, Shannon and I got two rabbits when I was about five. One day when we got home from school, Mum told us the news that Shannon and Kirillia's rabbit was dying from starvation. She then proceeded to sit us down in the living room to our di <laughs> She then proceeded to sit us down in the living room next to our dying rabbit. As it took its last breaths, she gave us a hard beaten speech about what happens to animals when we don't look after them the way God wants us to. It's safe to say that we never got another rabbit, but from that day on, we always feed our pets. Six months ago, I moved to Melbourne to play footy. Leaving my mum and dad was the hardest thing I've had to do. I spent those months FaceTiming mum or dad almost every day. We would watch the Australian Open together. She was the one I always went to when I felt sick and when I was unsure about something. And even if we didn't have anything to say, her just being on the other side of the phone gave me comfort. As I was going through year 11 and 12, mum began struggling more with her mental health. I struggled immensely, seeing my own mum, who was the strongest, brave woman I ever know, I will ever know, in so much pain. But mum and I actually had some great moments together, even though she was struggling in this time. I'd drive her places and we would play music and sing, or we would sit there in silence and I would hold her hand. We'd go for long walks, play trouble, garden, and a recent memory I have is designing and landscaping the front yard together. I'm so thankful that I had these moments with mum before I went to Melbourne. Mum more. Mum taught me to be honest, so here I am, raw and real. Mum taught me everything I know about Jesus. She taught me that with God, with me and in my heart, I can do absolutely anything. I struggle with this daily and I'm constantly learning what this means for me and for my life. But in knowing this through what she taught me and what I've learnt throughout my life, God is a good God who loves my mum. He loves our family. I know that where mum is right now is the happiest place she's ever been and the most loved she's ever felt. To my beautiful mama. I promise that in everything I do, I'll do it my best. Every time I run out to play a game of footy, will be for you. Even though I know you're already proud of me, I'll continue to make you proud. Not in what I can achieve, but in the person that I can be. I'm broken that you won't be there on my wedding day. To 
meet my children. I'm broken that you won't get to retire and go travelling with Dad around Australia. I'm broken that I can't hug you anymore. But I am fulfilled in knowing that you love me and will always be in my heart. I love you, Mum. Hello everybody, my name is Shannon and I'm mum's eldest daughter and according to my siblings, mum's favourite child. <laughs> Whilst I don't agree with this and can vouch 100% that mum never said that out loud to me behind closed doors, I can't deny the fact that mum and I shared a very unique and special bond. This bond lasted a beautiful 22 years from the day I was born to the day she entered her eternity with Jesus. I've struggled to articulate in words just what mum means to me. Everything I wrote honestly felt like it fell short of the woman mum was and the legacy she's left behind. But as mum says, as long as you try your best, God will do the rest. I was baked in mum's womb for only 29 weeks before deciding to make my grand entrance into the world. Born 11 and a half weeks premature, mum said I was quite a frightful surprise and mum wrote in the baby journal, that on the way to hospital, I got a very large contraction and thought you were going to come out, and I got very upset. Then the words of a song came to me, O oh Lord, you're beautiful, your face is all I seek. For when your eyes are on this child, your grace abounds to me. I had beautiful peace and assurance from God that he was in control and would look after us. Later in life, mum explained to me that in this moment, she gave me completely to God, that she knew that wherever... Whether I lived or died was beyond her control, but right from the start, she made an intentional, conscious decision to surrender me to God completely and trust that he would always be enough for me. Long story short, I pulled through, and to quote mum's words over and over again, I cannot believe I actually have a little girl. I like to think that perhaps because of mum's surrender of my life to God right from the beginning, God blessed our relationship of the relationship that mum and I had. Mum writes that I was mummy's little girl and she tells stories of how I would cry whenever she walked into the room if I could not be held or cuddled by her. Another thing I love to do as a toddler is sit and brush her hair. Reading that in my baby book this week was particularly powerful as I remembered a moment last year during one of her hospital visits. I went into the bathroom and grabbed the brush and began brushing it through her hair. During the psychiatric meeting that afternoon, a nurse asked her when she last felt as though her mental pain had been lifted. She looked at the nurse with a beautiful softness and said, when Shannon was brushing my hair. All throughout my childhood, mum was my best friend. I remember afternoons after school, sitting in the passenger seat of the car, the kitchen bench, and often the bathroom floor as she showered, just telling her all about my day, getting all of her advice and listening to how her day was too. We went on day trips together, some of my favourite being the Royal Adelaide show, specifically to watch the horses. She would say to me, I think the reason we get along so well is because you're just like your father. <laughs> Mum was the safest person in the world to me. I remember telling her how I couldn't believe the girls at school didn't talk to their mothers about life and how I just thought that was so weird. All I ever knew was that a mother was also a best friend. And so my best friend was strong, fearless, determined, obsessed with horses, cooked the best campfire meals I've ever tasted, would yell out, hold your horses, every time we drove up the steep driveway in our Port Nalunga house, believed in Jesus and his truth more passionately than I've ever known, wasn't afraid of telling you how to get your life right and the rubbish you need to get rid of, showed beautiful mercy to those who hurt her, compassion to those who find themselves in hard circumstances. She was spontaneous, crazy, and had the most infectious, beautiful laugh I've ever heard. 
one I've been playing on repeat this week as I fall asleep at night. I got my first horse at age 10, and this was something mum and I shared together until I was a young adult. At the age of 13, I remember laying bareback on our beautiful Bay Standard Bread Neo. I remember this day so clearly as if it's a moment in time I was intentionally meant to remember. It was the first time mum told me of her past and the mental agony she had carried at different seasons of her life. She opened up to me so beautifully and I wasn't afraid of it. She spoke of how much God loved her and that no matter what, she knew she was his child. She was loved and she would never be separated from him. So our beautiful friendship continued. When I graduated high school, she became my boss as I took on a full-time position at Wirraway Homestead. I'd grown into the strong-willed, faith-filled, fiery woman she had prayed for, passionate about Jesus and in love with his people. This was something we shared together for many years. We prayed together for those we knew needed healing and needed Jesus. We went on trips away together, just me and her. We would dream about the future, having a property where people could come and live and be with horses, eat good food and know how much Jesus loves them, completing endurance rides with the girls from Wirraway, the millions of grandkids that I would drop at her door so I could have weekends off, the extra room I was going to have in my house so she would never have to live in a retirement home, but she would say to me to... She would say to me things like, I'm still married, you know, and your dad and I will be travelling Australia when we're retired, Shan, not looking after your kids. All beautiful, stunning dreams. Mum, in all of my humanity, I wish I could wake up and this just be one big, horrible dream. I would have given absolutely anything for you to be well, and for, you to, and for your mind to be at peace here on earth. Three weeks ago, for the first time in quite a long time, we talked on the phone for almost an hour, and you laughed. I hadn't heard your laugh in a long time, and you gave me some good old mum advice, which you haven't felt you've been able to do in months. And we were happy just on the phone to one another, not really saying anything, just enjoying each other's company. It was like old times, Mum. And after I got off the phone to you, I just stopped and thanked God for it. I can barely fathom my life without you. (laughs) And the last two weeks have been filled with a pain so deep that at times I feel I can barely function. I never thought I would have to do life without you. And whilst I don't really know how to yet, you taught me that Jesus does. He is my only hope. He didn't promise you or me that our life would be easy and that we would never experience suffering or that we would ever be immune to pain. He promised us something better And that's an eternity in perfection that is for every human on the planet. The moment you gave your life to Jesus' mum, you started running your race. And it was the most stunning race I've ever seen. Now you've finished your race and you reap every reward in glory. So I'll run mine too, mum. I didn't think I'd be running it this soon without you, but I'll keep running it well until the day I see you again. I love you, mum. Hebrews 12, 2. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Thanks. For those who don't know me, I'm Kiralee, mum and dad's third child, the whirlwind who completely changed their pleasant idea of what parenting would be like. I remember a conversation once with mum where she told me that when you become a mother, your life is no longer about you. It's no longer about what you want or what you desire to have. It is all about your children. They become the most important thing to you and you put them above everything, no matter whether that means you might miss out or suffer from it. Mum was an extraordinary person. In everything, she set out to accomplish this goal, 
to put others before herself. She loved us, her children, so well. She loved all of us uniquely and unconditionally. There was one time I was rushing around like a nutter, cleaning my room, and Mum came in and asked what I was doing. I then explained that I had chosen one song to listen to and that my challenge was to have my room clean before it finished. She looked at me and laughed, saying, I used to do the exact same thing. You are like me in many ways, you know. And there are many ways I am like my mother. I have her orderliness, her stubbornness, her bravery and many other qualities. But something I don't have is her effortless nature to always think of others first. Mum hated to be under the spotlight. She thrived off of helping people and would never seek the glory for anything. She knew her place in God's kingdom, her place to love others as Jesus did. She taught me to depend on Jesus and to seek his ways in everything. Even in helping me, she always assured me that Jesus does a better job. Once when I was in hospital, I had just dislocated my toe and the doctor needed to put a needle right through it so that they could put it back into place. I hated needles with a passion at this stage and was crying and screaming before he even got the needle out. Mum held my hand and as he was about to put the needle in, Mum looks at me intensely and says, Curly, you can do this. Breathe in, Jesus. Breathe out, Jesus. Breathe in, Jesus. Breathe out, Jesus. And we both sat there in that hospital room speaking Jesus' name between our breaths in front of the doctor. It was in this moment that I learnt that I could depend on Jesus to be there for me that I was never alone, no matter what I was going through. It's not that the pain was any less, it's that with his strength, I could get through it. Mum often wrote about how her and Dad struggled to keep up with me. Mum often prayed for me that God would help turn me turn all of my energy, happiness and love for life into a useful work for his kingdom. She would call me her little pocket rocket and said that I was the happiest little person she ever knew. And I know she continues to pray over me that through this trial and through this pain, I will continue to carry that joy and happiness so that God may be glorified. And I feel those prayers being answered as I feel this peace and hope in my life in the midst of this pain and suffering. Mum, I will always miss you. When I wake in the morning and don't hear your slippers down the hallway, I will miss you. When I just want someone to come for a walk with me, I will miss you. When I need someone to chat to me whilst I clean my room, I will miss you. When I'm getting ready to marry the love of my life and you're not there to tell me how beautiful I look, I will miss you. When I'm screaming through labour, short births I can hope for thanks to you, and you're not there to hold my hand and tell me it's worth it, I will miss you. When my daughter grows up and rebels against me, telling me I'm the worst mother ever and you're not there to remind me of my rebel days and that she really does still love me, I will miss you. This is not the life I would have hoped to have. I never wanted to do this without you. The one thing I am sure of is that the mark you have left on my life will not allow you to ever be forgotten. Mum, you will live on in all of us and I will take the most out of this life that I possibly can. You will continue to encourage us forever. <coughs> As I have been spending time processing and grieving over these past two weeks, I've been able to get a fair bit of alone time whilst coming up with something special for today. When mum had a really bad back in the middle of 2018, she would sometimes need to lie down in the back of the car on long drives because this was the only way she could get comfortable. One time she was lying down across the back with her head on my lap. I can't recall the song I was singing, but I remember singing as usual. And mum looks up at me and says, well, this is the life, isn't it? Lying on my daughter's lap while she beautifully sings over me. And so in remembering mum and reflecting on her life, I've written a song that I would like to share with everyone. This song is really a worship song that is based off of some words that mum wrote in the middle of her suffering that we found in her Bible. As I sing it, I like to think of it as being in her perspective through her trials, but I also sing it over my life as a testament through this hard time. This is a little piece of the words she wrote. God is always faithful and in the storm with us. Suffering is real. Suffering is a part of being his. But more than that, we have hope, joy, eternity without suffering, security and purpose. The lyrics will be posted in, in the comments for you to read as I sing. Thank you.
my name's Glenn. Um, I'm Teresa's husband. Um, thanks for tuning in. For all of those that are online, um, yeah, there's just a few of us here, but to know that you guys are, are watching is incredible, and um, we really appreciate you being with us, even though you're not with us. Um, firstly, I just want to thank all of those that have sent messages, cards, comments, flowers, meals, and general care and prayer for all of us. Um, all of them have been extremely special, and each have had a special impact on us as a family. We're sensing your love, and it's very needed. Um, thank you. I also want to acknowledge my families while carrying so much grief and pain yourselves. Uh, you have reached out to us, cared for us, loved on us in so many ways. There are no words to describe the gratitude that we have in our hearts for you and from you. Thank you. Thank you to Mark and the team at Allgate Baptist for the venue here today, uh, Duncan at Simplicity Funerals, as well as our good friends Lee and Amanda um, who are here with us, leading and supporting us through this extremely tough time. Uh, for my children, you're the most incredible children that a father and mother could ever have. Our open and honest conversations are like none other that I think most parents experience. This has also meant that right now your honesty and grief has been a rock to me, as I can share my heart with you and you with me. God has given me a beautiful gift in each of you, and I cannot thank God enough for you guys in my life. Um, I just need to say that this has been, you know, obviously one of the most horrid times of our lives. And um, the words that have been coming out of my mouth lately have been that it's stupid, um, that it's ridiculous, um, that there's not a lot of understanding. Um, and, um, yeah, but I'll chew through this. Theresa and I met each other through church circles at what was known as Christie's Beach Church of Christ, where my father was the pastor. I would say I was about six or seven years of age. I spent most of my time at church in my late childhood and teens singing and chasing girls and having fun with the boys, which sometimes included chasing girls with the boys. And outside of that, sport. During this time, Teresa would use words to describe me such as silly, stupid, foolish and disinterested, although later on in life, she would say that I always loved her, but I just didn't realise it. Skipping ahead many years, Teresa and I found a new interest in each other. I figure either I had matured in some form or Teresa had immatured to a point that we could be slightly compatible. It was Easter about this time of the year in 1990 that a trip, which I will call the final girl chase, in my soon-to-be-broken Mazda 929 to camp in Berry with Teresa's family was the kindling that sparked a fire for the next 30 years. I still remember just sitting on the oval together near the caravan park, just talking for hours. We couldn't get enough of each other, and my care for her grew deeper and deeper over the next year and a half, and I realised that her love for me and care for others was what I wanted in my life, and I asked her to be my bride. It needs to be said that the pastor who was involved in our marriage preparation at the time actually said that he never witnessed such an incompatible survey result on the way in which we handled conflict and other matters. But we loved each other so much that we were willing to work through our differences and tie the knot. We already shared a love for young people and for attempting to be positive role models and leading many youth to understand who Jesus was together. And we coordinated many youth events. We just loved being together to make a difference in people's lives. On the 25th of April 1992, we'd be married and continued our adventure together. We were one. We just loved what each other loved. We both sacrificed for each other. We were the best of friends and we would often call each other lover. But I was definitely batting above my average. And I would often call her my trophy wife, with which I would get a cheeky, her cheeky sideways smile. Teresa was not only my best friend, but this would be the start of us seeking out what God wanted for our lives together and how we could best use the gifts we'd been given to love others and share in what we knew about who Jesus was. We shared so much in common. Our love for sport, playing basketball and netball together. I coached her in basketball. We enjoyed the outdoors and camping, for friendships, for music. We even became Port Adelaide members as she sacrificed her Norwood bias, dislike for Port Adelaide in the AFL, and I can still hear her singing, never tear us apart, and it will be a huge hole if I go there again, and she's not with me. 
Back in 1992, our honeymoon was mostly spent in Flinders Ranges. Camping here together and as a family since have been some of the best highlights of our lives. The Australian countryside and places like the Flinders are something that we both loved and had in common, and now it's great to see our children sharing in this love as well. We had plans of not travelling too far internationally because of what we knew Australia offered as such a beautiful and relaxing destination. In 1996, our firstborn came into the world, Brody. Theresa could never have been more in love and more proud of our beautiful baby boy. She was an incredible mother to Brody and later in life to our girls. She loved you immensely. The pure joy she experienced at your wedding, Brody and Bella, like most of us, could not be wiped off her face. And Bella, you were like another daughter to her and she loved you so much. She was so proud of both of you and your choice to marry each other. And my heart grieves now that you haven't experienced her best, but just know she loved you and longed to know you more. Therese and I shared a love for Jesus. He is and was our everything. Some of you listening might at this point want to say, well, look where that got you, some good that did. But I do need to say that Jesus isn't just a magic bottle that we rub for our own good or some kind of crutch. I don't have the answers for everything, but I do know that he is with Teresa now and he is with us in our grief if we take the time to listen. In our love for Jesus, we came to understand that he is far more than religious rules and exercises. Sometimes these things are a mere distraction to the man who lived on this earth, stated that he was the son of God, gave his life and rose again, conquering death. We just wanted to understand more of him and how, he could be, how we could be more like him and how he could love through us to love others. This led us to Perth where we lived for three years and I studied my bachelor degree in theology. We came to know many people um, who we call lifelong friends and where we started our journey in just being open to what God wanted, being influenced by loving people and also loving others. In Perth, Teresa's eyes were opened further to her own possibilities of loving people and sharing her heart. One of the most meaningful times in Perth was being able to, was for her, was to be able to go on a mission trip to visit Indigenous communities in Port Hedland with friends like Neil Meredith and Christy Geyer. This trip inspired Teresa's passion for Indigenous people. And while we hadn't formally entered into a role in these communities up to this point, it would not have surprised me if one day we did. It's here in Perth that we had two more children, Shannon and Kiralee, both births being a little bit too fast. Shannon particularly being born at 29 weeks after driving at 100 miles an hour to the Armadale Hospital while in labour pains with Teresa singing, for when your eyes are on this child, your grace abounds to me, a song called Oh Lord, You're Beautiful by Keith Green. Shan, you and mum had a unique relationship, a very rare friendship where you would talk about anything. Her love for you is immense, the things you shared such as your love for horses and people was incredible, but her desire for you is always to find your own path in this life, wherever God leads you, and I know that she knew that this will always be meaningful and special. Kiralee was another fast trip to the King Edward Hospital hospital at breakneck speed down the freeway, where she was born just 20 minutes after arrival. Teresa would kill me for saying this, but the doctors would say that she had a very efficient uterus, whatever that means. Basically, in my language, it would mean very fast. And where most women would go through excruciating pain for hours on end, for Teresa, it was nothing like that. Kiralee, you've always been mum's little power pack. Your energy for life and faith and music and everything brought mum so much joy. She is incredibly proud of you and was right behind you in your life decisions. You shine like a light to the world. It soon became evident that Teresa would become not only a person who loved others, no matter who they were, but that she would be the best loving mother a child could ever have. Brody asked me the other day what I thought Teresa's greatest achievement um, was, and while I thought of some things, the penny dropped. Teresa's greatest achievement was in growing and developing four children who in turn loved others as Jesus loved her. She loved them with everything she had. After three years in Perth, our adventure took another turn, back to Adelaide. Before I go there, I just need to say that just the other day when we were able to watch Hannah's first game in Perth against the Eagles, 
Teresa mentioned that she didn't really want to go back to Perth. When I asked her why, she said that she loved it so much when she was there between 97 and 2000 that she didn't want her memory spoiled. I want to personally thank you, Perth crew, for being who you were to Teresa. She loved you, and it was amazing to see some of you when we were there just a month or so ago. So back to Adelaide we come. Just one and a bit years in, and we're blessed with, our, with the birth of our fourth child. I remember Teresa at the time when she found out that she was pregnant uh, with Hannah. Teresa was extremely stressed. You see, Brody was the dream child sleeping through the night two weeks after being born, eating everything, calm, just the perfect baby. Shannon, although prem um, and the difficulties with this, was also amazing, slept well, calm, sweet, but Kiralee, and not in a bad way, but she was a goer. <laughs> All of a sudden, we had to move things around the house that wouldn't normally be moved. She did things like eating caterpillars, crawled super fast, climbed pantries, painted her sister, would attack her siblings and was just larger than life. So for Teresa, another potential Kiralee was like a bomb was about to hit. But Teresa took it in her stride and all the kids thankfully are now adults and alive to tell their own story. Teresa's efficient uterus kicked into overdrive with Hannah's birth because although I was driving at 150 kilometres an hour down the Southern Expressway towards Flinders Hospital, we didn't quite make it. And with help from our good friend Kathy Ramsey, Hannah was delivered in the back of our EF Falcon. Teresa was overjoyed and for Teresa to call our baby Hannah Joy has not been an understatement at all as Hannah brought so much joy to Teresa and all of us. Hannah, she was, as we both are, so proud of you for everything you have done, especially in this last six months and sticking to your dreams. She loved watching your games, so proud to wear your colours, so proud to watch you play that first game. When you kick that first goal, your everyday FaceTime chats, you brought her so much happiness. She loved you passionately. Excuse me, just for one second. What Teresa has done, though, in investing into her kids is nothing short of a miracle. The way they pour themselves into others is a true testament of Teresa's character and God moving through her. She had strength that not many, other, not many have, and the vision of that is now in her children, and I am eternally grateful for who she was to them. Our adventure didn't stop with just kids, though. We would be involved in church ministry, in starting our own business with Timber Creek, and now at Wirraway Homestead. Wirraway is like the culmination of everything that God has done in both of us up to that point in time seven years ago. Teresa is a horse owner from about the age of 15, a great organiser and administrator and a person who didn't just take the status quo but researched the truth and facts and then put them into practice was unbelievable. For myself, with experience as a carpenter and the needs for maintenance, a former pastor and the needs to lead staff and a business owner, with the both of us glued together, we couldn't actually say no to a place that positively impacted over 3,000 young people per year and saw lives change for the better right in front of our eyes. It's an incredible fit and one that I would dearly miss having my beautiful wife by my side in. Horses were a big part of this decision for Teresa, but more importantly, the impact that horses can have on people's lives. How she led the horse area at Wirraway and cared for the horses themselves was a true testament to her faith, but I will add that she did have much more in store for Wirraway. I need to this time to say thank you to my staff and to the Wirraway board your love for Teresa and myself has been inspiring. I know you share my and the family's grief and we walk this road together as we have done over the last 12 months. Thank you. I love you dearly. Teresa had struggled with mental health issues not long before we got together in Berry in 92 and after we were married and in Perth. Her struggle was an obsessive compulsive disorder that had to do with her faith. Sometimes this would lead to other depressive thinking. Basically, to explain to everyone, um, or to explain, everyone has intrusive thoughts at times. Our brains are thought machines. 
So we will all at times have one unwanted or desired thoughts that we might say, where did that come from? That's a bit weird. Um, and we'll just brush it off. They might bother us, but we can work out pretty quickly that they actually mean nothing. Teresa had thoughts about her faith, things that seemed against God that she felt couldn't be forgiven, even though this was contrary to the truth. For 20 plus years after living in Perth, Teresa might have had these thoughts, but she could easily brush them off. They meant nothing. After some stressful situations in 2017, these thoughts could no longer just be brushed off. They seemed to mean something to her, and the more she feared them, the worse it became. She recovered, and I actually remember some of our best moments of marriage in 2018, but Teresa then experienced a debilitating bulge disc in her back, which then sent her into another mental health spin. This last 12 months, these intrusive thoughts and feelings have been all-encompassing, and while and after quite a few hospital visits and medications, she felt there was no way out, even though that wasn't the truth. The moments leading up to her death clearly indicated that Teresa wasn't grounded in reality and wasn't making clear decisions that were about the things she actually loved, but that her mind was in total confusion and not herself. I just want to leave you with two things um, today. On her Instagram profile is a quote, and it comes from a brilliant movie called Seabiscuit, just one of the many horse movies that we have in our home. And the quote is, you don't throw a whole life away just because it's banged up a little. The reason Teresa loved this quote is because she lived it. If you're a person that was broken, hurting, drug dependent, homeless, addicted, different, despised or just sad, Teresa had room for you in her heart and room for you in her home, in our home. This comes from her faith in who Jesus is and when he said things like, Love your neighbour as you love yourself, and whatever you do for the least of these, you do for me. She lived it. You see, Jesus is about compassion for the lost and broken. And because Jesus was about this, so was Teresa. Today, more than ever, we need to know Jesus' compassion for us as broken people. And we need to know how to give unconditional love. The kind of love that Jesus gave to Teresa and what Teresa gave to me, our children, and many others. And two, if I was to speak words for her right now, she would tell you that lo Jesus loves you dearly. She would say that whatever descriptions you have heard about Jesus that he doesn't love, that all he does is judges you for your behaviour, is just to kill joy and doesn't want you to enjoy life, is more likely a product of what you've heard about religion. It's definitely not what the man himself was like if you read about him. If this was her last moment before you, she would simply ask you to seek out the man who lived on this earth and who openly agreed that he was the son of God and not just base what you know about him by practices you might have experienced from religion or other people. What Teresa experienced through her faith while she was healthy was pure joy and love and she made a difference to this earth because of it. Now Teresa would want you to know, want you to know that she's okay, that she's in the arms of Jesus and it's in this that we find some hope amongst the pain of missing her so dearly. This time on earth is fleeting, but time with Jesus is forever. Teresa now lives in that forever. John 3, 16 to 18. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. When Teresa met God on the 31st of March, he probably would have welcomed her with open arms and said something like, well done, well done, good and faithful servant. Thanks.
everyone that's uh, participating with you today, um, family. I'd just like to thank you for your amazing tributes to an amazing mother, daughter, sister, wife, and friend, Teresa. I just want to share a, a poem and a scripture that I've definitely seen being lived out in the Munyard House over the past couple of weeks. The poem goes like this. You can shed tears that she is gone or you can smile because she has lived. You can close your eyes and pray that she'll come back or you can open your eyes and see all that she has left. Your heart can be empty because you can't see her or you can be full of the love that you shared. You can turn your back on tomorrow and live yesterday, or you can be happy for tomorrow because of yesterday. You can remember her and only that she is gone, or you can cherish her memory and let it live on. You can cry and close your mind, be empty and turn your back, or you can do what she would want, smile, Open your eyes, open your heart, love, and go on. In John chapter 14, verse 27, it says this, this is Jesus. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Will you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, inasmuch as you in your sovereign love have called our loved one and friend Teresa to be with you, we express our thanks for the privilege of knowing her. We thank you for the way she impacted our lives and for your grace through these difficult times. We are grateful for your love. You have prepared a place for all who trust you and you alone are worthy of our praise. So to you we turn for continued strength, continued comfort, continued perspective, continued purpose, both now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm now going to hand over to Duncan Ferguson who's going to guide us through the final part of our arrangements today. Thank you, Lee. Thank you for everyone who has contributed so amazingly to our time here today. Again, acknowledgement to every one of you that are watching at the moment. Over 350 groups of people if we were all together in one place, we'd need a fair size auditorium to fit you all in. But it is a real testimony uh, to Teresa. And I have uh, just stood back in absolute amazement at what has been shared today. And if ever there was a gathering and an occasion where 1 Thessalonians 4.13 has been epitomised, it's been today. Because today... And as in that verse, the reality of grief is acknowledged. And we've seen that in this beautiful family, what they're going through. And for many of you that are watching on today. And I know an unimaginable journey lies ahead for this family. But yet in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, another thing pervades and that is a hope. And that's what we've seen shared today incredible how each of you have shared and what a testimony to what Teresa has invested in you and that's living on today and I just want to say before we finish up today if those that are watching today find the hope that this family have talked about is foreign to you do everything you can to search it out explore it because that's the very hope that's going to see this family face the future that's ahead of them and face it with strength 
with dignity and with promise. I know that will be the case. So with those thoughts in mind, we are going to speak words of committal over Teresa right now. So I'm going to ask those who are present here now to stand and maybe you who are watching, wherever you might be, to stand with us as we speak these words of committal. Thank you. In grief at her death, but in gratitude for Teresa's life, today, family and friends have gathered to say a final goodbye to Teresa and her life here on earth. We are grateful for the life that has been lived, for all that her life has meant to us. We now leave Teresa in peace and with respect and love, we bid her goodbye. Tenderly and reverently, we commit Teresa into the hands of Jesus. We now commit her body to be cremated, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And we entrust Teresa into the care of a loving and compassionate God. That now brings our time here to a close today. Again, thank you for everyone who has looked on, participated, and who will continue to show your love and support as we move forward from here. Thank you.